Well, I have to say it's a real pleasure to be here, and many thanks to Dave for inviting me. Uh, I, I have found it a most interesting convention so far, and I look forward to more. Um, yes, as I mentioned, Dave gave me the title for this talk. I've never given this talk before. I decided I was going to do it just extempore, no slides, lots of preparation, but only in my head. There's nothing physical, because I wanted to give you a different sort of a talk at this different sort of a convention. Dave asked me to talk about fairy primarily in the Celtic lunar calendar, so I called it Altered States of Time because one of the key things with the fairy mythology is the shift in time experience. So let's start with a story. You're a young Dutch guy. You've got wife and kids, but you just need a little bit of time out, so you go for a walk in the countryside. And while you're on that walk in the countryside, you meet up with some really cool people. And these guys say to you, hey, we're having a party. Come and join us. And you think, sod the wife and kids. I'm going for that party. And I tell you, that music's so good. You can't stop dancing. The party doesn't go all night. It goes all weekend. And you are dancing your socks off. You are in a completely different state of reality, lost somewhere in the field. Party ends. You come down with a bump. You're lying in a bit of a muddy field. <laughs> when you get up, you realise that you're a bit too stiff in the joints. It wasn't just the dancing. You realise you've got a grey beard and pretty long hair. And, and, it, and, and you're walking like an old man. Now, I know parties can get you like that, but this was one <laughs> hell of a party. When you get home, your wife has died, your kids have grown up, and you've got grandchildren. <clears throat> that's fairy for you. That's actually a bit cruel fairy. That's Dutch fairy for you. The Celts are a bit kinder. In the Celtic mythology, a night and a day in their land is a year and a day in this one. So we have similar stories, I just think, off the top of my head, of the tale of Bran and Necton. And Bran and Necton were two of the Fianna Fáil, the great warriors of Ireland. And for various different reasons I won't go into, they got invited over to Tin Anog. And they couldn't resist because the fairy women are just irresistible. They had a great time in Tin Anog, but at one time Bran really wanted to go back and see, see Erin, see his homeland, but he was warned, don't touch the soil. So they sailed in the boat over from Tiernanog to, to, to the western shores of Erin, and there they were, and he was on the boat, and people came because they'd heard that Bran was there, the great warrior from mythology, and he was talking, and Necton, he just had to leave the boat to kiss the soil of Erin, and as he did so, he turned to dust. Because hundreds, if not thousands of years had passed in the meantime that they had been living in Tiernanog. This is time shift in mythology. And I, 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 I quite enjoy this, this, this idea of a night and a day being equal to a year and a day. And it sort of makes me think of the whole Einsteinian relativity of time stuff, where you've got the twins, I don't know if you know that one, and there's a twin goes off in a rocket at whatever speed it is, and he spends a couple of years in outer space, um, and his other twin stays back at home, and when he comes back, his other twin's aged by 20 years and he's aged by two, something like that. And I sort of wonder if, if that's the meaning of being spaced out, shift in time, out in space. But a friend of mine really played with this idea 
of this link between fairy time and Einsteinian relativity of time, where if you're travelling at the speed of light, if you are a light beam, time stops. It's always now. You are in perpetual now. Is this what we mean by enlightenment? We're at that light speed. We are enlightened, the light body, the always now, the immortal, the divine. This is eternity. This is immortality. This is perpetual now, speed of light. So this friend of mine, he worked out speed of sprite. Speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. Speed of sprite turned out to be about 143,000 miles per second. So here we've got time, space, light, mythology, all like playing in together as one thing. And I sort of wonder, I have this sort of funny feeling that those of us who experience these time shifts, who shift a little bit into that world of fairy or enlightenment or divinity, if somehow inside ourselves we are actually living less time, a bit like that twin in the rocket. And yet on the other hand, with the fairy mythology, when you come back to this plane, your body hasn't. So there might be quite a few people who are in quite old bodies but inside, they're still just teenagers, because they've done an awful lot of being spaced out. <laughs> so I'll give an example of, of this, a, a personal example of this. Because one of the things about fairy is that it's linked with sacred sites. You, you, you can come across fairy anywhere, but in, in the British, the Celtic tradition, you're most likely to move into that realm when you're in a stone circle or you're on a sacred hilltop or you're in one of the long barrows. These are all associated with shifting into that other dimension, that other reality. And when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was about 20, um, I, I was very fortunate in those days, I got a grant. And so when the grant came in at the beginning of term, I'd buy a whole lump of hashish, and slowly over the term I'd sell it off to very few close friends, um, which gave me the money to live by and put a little bit of money aside. So come the summer break, three months, I could get my pack on my back, polish off my thumb and head off. And I headed off to well, it was to Ethiopia, actually. So I hitched across to Athens, night plane into Cairo, went to the train station in Cairo to get my ticket for the train to Aswan. And the train wasn't until sunset. And I'd arrived at dawn. And what do you do if you've got a day to kill in Cairo? Go to the pyramids. Obvious thing. Got on the bus, went to the pyramids. I got to the pyramids so early that the camels were still sleeping. <laughs> and there was no little kid going back sheesh. But in those days, the pyramids were just open. So I just climbed in. I'd been there the previous year. I'd been to the king's chamber, wasn't interested. Went down to the queen's chamber. So we're now talking 7, 8 in the morning. It's still early. Sat down in the queen's chamber and had this experience that that although I knew that there was tons of stone over me, it was all just empty space. And every now and then I could hear guides bringing in parties of people taking them up to the king's chamber, and it's like I could hear everything quite clearly from where I was down in the queen's chamber. And once or twice the guides brought the parties down into the queen's chamber, but not often, mostly I was just sitting there on my own. Now I remember I was about 20, I hadn't even heard the word yoga, let alone know what meditation was. But after a while I got bored, because you do, don't you? And anyway, you know, you need to eat and drink and have a pee and stuff like that. So, you know, I got bored after a little while, put the pack on my back, crawled out again. I just made that sunset train, literally jumping into the third class carriage as it was pulling out the station. I had lost eight hours. I had experienced maybe one or two, but 
But whereas I'd gone into the pyramid about eight in the morning when I came out, it was about four in the afternoon. I didn't experience an altered state. I was just sitting in the pyramid. I hadn't taken any drugs because I'd just come on a plane through from one country to another. And I'm, no, I'm not quite careful that way, but I was quite careful at that particular moment in time. It was a complete altered state of time, but not an altered state of consciousness. In my experience, I was just sitting there. These things happen in sacred sites. I've had it more than one. I could carry on giving you stories about experiences of shifting into that other reality using sacred site energy, which is a very different sort of energy. And, and whilst I've been doing research with meditators and, and shifting into that other state of reality through meditation, this is one that comes about by the power of place. And we're really fortunate here in Britain because we've got lots of these places. And I do recommend, you know, from, from research I've done and looking at what, what is going on within us at a physiological level, at a psychological level and so on, you want to shift into that other reality for whatever reason, then to go to a sacred site when the moon is full at 3 o'clock in the morning, you've got it. 90% certainty you are going to have some sort of major experience, whether it's a time one or something else, seeing things, seeing visions, having other experiences. These places are designed. There's something in the design which we don't yet know about. Well, I've gone beyond where the research has got to. We started looking at things like magnetic activity and what's going on in the brain and so on, but we haven't actually got to what is it that's going on. And my understanding, I mean, in the traditions, these places were built by the fair folk. The fair folk were the magic beings that had somehow created these magic places where we are affected and we're still affected to this day. But there's been very little work to look at what these scientists of the psychic arts, these scientists of the subtle other realities, what they were doing and how they were doing it. And apart from Paul Devra's work with the Dragon Project back in the 70s, there has been zilch research into it. And it's about time. So what I'm doing here is I'm just throwing out ideas to young people who've got the time and the energy and hopefully can now get the resources to start looking at this. Because it's the great unexplored area within this field of research. So, I'm running out of time. I haven't even mentioned Celtic Lunar Calendar, but I've reached the point where the Celtic Lunar Calendar comes in because the Celtic Lunar Calendar was actually first talked about about 100 years ago when they found some bronze tablets in Coligny in France with a lunar calendar that had been etched out in, in the bronze around 500-600 AD. And it was Romano-British and it's, it was from the Celtic peoples. And it's a lunar calendar that works in an identical fashion with the Tibetan and the Chinese solar lunar calendars. Now, a pure lunar calendar is a bit like the Islamic one, and that will actually just follow the moon, and over the course of several years, Ramadan is happening in different months over different years because the sun and the moon don't quite fit in their dance. So to get a solar lunar calendar that actually fits in the dance requires quite a lot of precision work. And we can see that origins of that precision work within the stone circles and the megalithic monuments in Britain and France, where we've got orientations going to such definable points as, as the, 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 the winter solstice sunrise, the summer solstice sunrise, the cross-quarter days, which are the, the ones that, that fall halfway between the solstices and the equinoxes. We've got um, West Kennet, which is aligned to the equinox. 
um, we've got Glastonbury Tour, which is aligned on the cross-quarter days, and so on. And not only do we have these alignments with the sun and the movement of the sun from the, the solstices and the equinoxes and the cross-quarter days, we also have alignments with the moon. Because the moon in an 18 and a half year old cycle also moves between the equivalent of the winter and the summer solstice points, although it moves slightly further than the winter and the summer solstice movement points. So we've got these lunar alignments also marked in the various different megalithic monuments. So when we're going into that fairy space of, the, of, the, of, of these monuments, we are linking in with a calendar system as well, another way of marking time, of <coughs> measuring time, but of measuring the time of this planet. It's a really interesting idea. If anybody wants to start working with the Celtic lunar calendar, I, worked, I lived by it for 13 years. I really went into it as a living thing for quite a long period of my life before I got taken off to India to work with yogis and, and Buddhists. But it was while I was looking at the whole fairy stuff and I started to live that calendar that had come from the Celtic period, which was built onto the calendar, built into the megalithic monuments. Now, what I found when you do that is you get a really strong sense of the movement, the dance between the sun and the moon and the earth. And our modern calendar doesn't follow that dance. So for instance, our modern calendar says that midsummer solstice is the beginning of summer. But actually, that's midsummer solstice. It's not the beginning of summer, it's the middle of summer, it's the longest day. Summer begins at Beltane, which is the 1st of May, because in an Earth space of time, that's the growing period. That's when things are really growing. You need as somebody living on the land to know when that shift is happening and things are really starting to grow well. And so there's lots of traditions connected with the hawthorn tree and the may blossom and this whole thing of the growing. And it's the time of, of the coming together, the joining, the fertilizing, that whole aspect of the beginning of summer. With midsummer, the lightest time, being the peak of it. Not the beginning of it, but the peak of it. And then the end of it we're just coming to, beginning of August, Lunasad or Lammas Tide, and this is the beginning of harvest. It's when the growing is finished, you've done your growing, and you're starting the harvest. You're starting to reap in the rewards of all that you've grown during the summertime. And so autumn is actually beginning when we're still thinking it's summer because we're on a, on a, on a city calendar rather than on an earth-based calendar that's linked in with the movements of the sun and also with it the movements of the moon. So that when you're following the festivals, you not only follow this earth-sun-based movement, but you link it together with the phases of the moon. Now, celebrating festivals is about marking moments, marking key points. So, let's say Beltane, the beginning of summer, you do Beltane in terms of the moon at the first quarter of the moon, when the moon is coming into its fullness, where you're getting into the real light part of the moon. And you do that at dawn, which is the beginning of the day. So you've got the day coming into its beginning, you've got the moon coming into its real light half, and you've got the year coming into its real light half. Then, when you are at harvest time, at Lammas tide, you celebrate that at full moon, because this is where the growing points reached its fullness. So you celebrate at full moon, and you celebrate at midday because this is when the day is at its height. So you've got the season of the year, the sun, you've got the moon, and you've got the day all 
matching together into the same aspect, and it's really powerful. We still, to some extent, celebrate this with, with, um, with Samhain, which is also known in our culture as Halloween. Because part of the Halloween celebrations at the beginning of November are Guy Fawkes Night. And when is the fire lit for Guy Fawkes Night? It's lit at sunset. Because sunset is the right time, because now you're going into the dark part of the year. So Halloween's the entrance into the dark, the beginning of winter is, is coming now into the beginning of November. And so you do that when the moon is going into its last quarter. When the moon is starting its dark phase, and you do it at sunset. And then the final festival at Imbolc, February, um, is at the dark of the dark of the dark. That's the beginning of February at midnight with dark moon. And so you're celebrating each of the phases of the moon, each of the points of the day together with all of the points within the solar, and you're bringing the whole lot together. And for those of you into ceremony, ritual, and this whole working with this other state of experience, a fairy state of experience, I do recommend it. Now, there's loads more that I could talk about with that, but I promised that I would stop for a few minutes for question and answer and not prattle on too long. As this is completely extemporary, nothing written down, no slides, just where my mind took me as I look at you lot. I'm going to stop now. Thank you for listening to me. We have a time, 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 time. Yeah, a minute, a few minutes for questions, if anybody has a question at all. Your chair. Yeah, yeah as um, somebody who uh, grew up in the corner and spent a lot of time studying circles and food, I think you resonate with what you're talking about. And um, myself and my wife uh, were down to Cornwall Island and we went to uh, the Fugu at Carnini. And we meditated there on the 21st of December and a lot of energy work and meditation. And what came through strongly was that those were used for journey. So it's very interesting that we're talking about the use of these areas for this kind of work. And yeah. actually having to spend the time there and that, It's a lovely point because what I found in, in my experiences is that going into the Fugus or going into the Long Barrows, when you go into them, A, you're completely in the dark, no light, B, no radio waves or any other electromagnetic waves at all. So in terms of the effect on our psyche, you're going into a place of quiet, electromagnetic quiet. It is perfect for clairvoyance, for travelling out of the body, for precognition, for all of those receptive psychic, absolutely perfect conditions. Whereas if you go to the stone circles or you go to the hilltops, what you've got is increased magnetic activity. A lot of the stones are also magnetic, or Khan Ingli, the stone is incredibly magnetic. This again affects us in such a way for the active, for seeing ghosts, for seeing visions, for dancing with the fairies, for healing work, putting out that psychic energy, for magic work, doing, doing that sort of ritual. They are designed, specifically designed, for these different two sorts of psychic work. Thank you for bringing that out. Very good point. Uh, it's time for a question, this one. Yeah. You need to speak up as, as well if you can. Sorry, yeah. Um, in a lot of the, the folk tales, stories, accounts of people who use the fairy realm, one of the things that comes up again and again is that it, it's, if they eat the food or take the drink, they, they can come back hundreds of years later and time passes at a very different rate. If they don't take the offering of the food or drink, they, you know, the time seems to be about the same that they experience, yes. you know, they come back and it's the same night, but they have yeah. something to eat while they're there, yes. and they come back and the involved family are gone, it's 50 years later, yeah. and that uh, the theme of the, the food and drink seems to come up again and again, why, why do you think that? It, it's a very interesting one, that one, isn't it? The effect of food and drink while you are in the other world and that affecting the sense of, of time and the experience of time. And the only thing that I come across is that in all 
all religions, going from the, 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 the shamanic all the way through, we have this thing of, you know, taking the sacred wafer, the sacred food. And that the sacred food alters your personal substance in some way towards a measure of enlightenment, whatever that might be. Yes? So that is what I have taken from those stories, that by actually partaking of that other world substance or that sacred substance so you affect yourself and affecting yourself not just in, in the mental way the, the psychic way but also at some sort of physical way as well some transmutation is going on and I, I in my book The Fairy Faith I actually link the, all the fairy mythologies with our experience of poltergeist and haunting and with the modern, what I call the modern fairy experience of UFO. And I think that what we have here is what I would call a psychokinesis. So up till now I've been talking about telepathy and so on. But there's also a sort of a psychokinesis, a mind over matter thing that is going on. And we're in what Patrick Harper, his name be blessed forever, uh, calls the demonic reality. That this is a reality that is allied with this physical one. It's not totally otherworld. It's a reality where there is this interconnection that is going on with all these weird shifts that happen, but the interconnection is still possible. Thank you. Lovely question. I think uh, that, that draws this uh, session to a conclusion. Uh,